That's why we must let go of our pain and regret. And remember what it is we're really fighting for. The ones we love. Let that be the light that guides you through the most treacherous of times. And the darkest of nights. Welcome to Avatar Nation, a podcast all about the Netflix live adaptation of Avatar, The Last Airbender. Whether you're a longtime fan like us, or you're new to the Avatarverse, join us as we dive into each episode and analyze the retelling of TV's greatest adventure. Welcome back, everybody. I'm your host, Pauline. And I'm Wes. And I have to say, I am full from that fuller of an episode. Wait. Filler of an episode. Filler. <laughs> I guess we are halfway, over halfway through. We are over halfway through. How do you feel about that? I feel full. Is that the, a good thing or a no, bad thing? No, I feel like the episode was a filler. Yeah, it was definitely a setup episode, I would say. I think there are no filler episodes when it comes to Avatar. I mean, there's some that might lean towards filler episodes, but there's always something important going on there that helps sets up for the next episode. But I see what you're saying. This one, it was not my favorite. It wasn't bad. I'm just, what a cliffhanger, huh? But there are several other episodes that have a cliffhanger ending. Omashu, for example, right? Yeah, I agree. Also, props to you for giving me advice on turning on the subtitles. Yeah, I give that advice to everybody. I am a subtitles girly. No matter what it is I'm watching, if it's something new, if it's something I've watched over and over again, I love having subtitles on. And I know I'm not alone out there, but I don't know. I just, it's, I have a hard time understanding things just verbally or auditorially i have to say i agree with that but <laughs> <laughs> no but what for this you... episode seriously if you didn't have the subtitles on you miss some background stuff they were talking about so yes for sure if you aren't a subtitle person watch it through without subtitles once and then upon rewatching, because we rewatch episodes before discussing them the second time i definitely recommend having subtitles on because there's some nuggets there that you don't catch they made the well. episode a little better Yes. I can't wait to get into this episode for good and bad reasons. The crazy thing is we only have three episodes left after this. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. You sound so excited. <laughs> I'm right down the middle. Okay. I I think you are right down the middle because every I feel like you've loved every other one. Yeah. And then like the ones in between those, you're not such a big fan of, so... All right. Well, before we get started talking about this episode, I do just want to remind everybody and encourage you all to follow and subscribe to this podcast. Uh, that way you don't miss out when we come out with new episodes and it would just help the podcast a lot. And, and it means a lot to us if you do so. All right, Pauline, you ready to get into this episode? All right, let's do it. So for our episode T for this one, the all the nitty gritty t details, as we know, this one is titled Spirited Away. It is an obvious nod to the Studio Ghibli film Spirited Away, which Great we love. Shout out to Hayao Miyazaki. I didn't Google to confirm that's why they called this episode Spirited Away, but it's no big secret that the original creators of Avatar took a lot of inspiration from Miyazaki and that played a big role in the creation of Avatar The Last Airbender. So I would say even without Googling, I am 99.9% .9 confident that this title is a nod to Hopefully film. no one fact checks you. Yeah, maybe we need someone to fact check us. 
Um, and then the episode was directed by Roseanne Young, known for Shadow in the Cloud, Do No Harm, and My Wedding and Other Secrets. Writing credits go to Gabriel Yanis. He has written for Grey's Anatomy, National Treasure, Edge of History, and Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live. Wow. Have you watched The Ones Who Live? Or are you in the middle of watching that? I mean, is that a, a name of an episode or is that the name of... I thought that was a series? a series, a spinoff series. I just watched The Walking Dead. Oh, just the main? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. All righty. Well, do you want to do our episode recap and remind everybody what all went down in this episode? Let's get it on. The episode kicks off with Team Avatar evading firebenders in a thrilling forest chase. Narrowly avoiding capture, they discover an Earth Kingdom village affected by the Fire Nation's destructive actions, leading Aang to promise the rescue of villagers believed to be trapped in the spirit world. Elsewhere, Zuko gets a new lead on Team Avatar's whereabouts. Upon investigating, he learns that the word of the Avatar's return has spread, diminishing his hopes of capturing him. Frustrated by his potential competition, he reluctantly hires June, the bounty hunter, to find Aang. Meanwhile, in the Fire Nation, Azula convinces Fire Lord Ozai to provide additional resources to Commander Zhao. However, her attempt to gain favor fails, showing early cracks in her confidence. In the spirit world, Team Avatar finds themselves face to face with Hua Xing Tong, the spirit of knowledge. Their journey takes a more dangerous turn when they encounter Heibai, an angry forest spirit that attacks them. The trio are separated in the fog of lost souls, which forces them to face deeply personal and painful memories. Katara relives the day the Fire Nation attacked her village and killed her mother, and Sokka is brought back to the day of his ice-dodging ceremony, where he overheard his father's disappointment in him. Aang, however, is strong enough to resist his memories, though his resolve is tested by Ko, the Face Stealer, a primal spirit seeking to prey on their souls. He escapes Koi... Ko. <laughs> he escapes Ko and emerges from the fog, leading to an emotional reunion with Gyatso, who stayed in the spirit world to wait for Aang. Gyatso tells Aang to let go of the guilt he feels for the destruction of the Southern Air Temple. Aang also learns that his friends and the villagers will be devoured by Ko, and that the avatar who last faced him was Roku. Guided by Gyatso's wisdom, Aang resolves to seek out a connection with Avatar Roku at his shrine so he can confront Ko. The episode ends with Aang journeying to the Fire Nation on his own. Alrighty. Thanks for reading our recap. That was fun. Shall we get into our cabbage rating? Yeah, let's talk about it. Do you want to go first or do you want me to give my cabbage rating first? I feel like you're looking at me like you want to go first. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> okay, so for my cabbage rating, I'm not going to lie. I started out at a five. That's how I immediately felt after the episode ended. And then after re-watching it and doing all my notes, I did bump it up to a six. Wow. So it's still my least or I guess my lowest rated episode of the season so far. I bumped it up because I could see what they were trying to do here. And there was more to the episode upon rewatching it than I initially thought. So I am excited to talk about that. But I just feel like, I don't know, it was very hit and miss. There was a lot that they tried to pack into one episode. And then I feel like it caused the episode to suffer. That is my cabbage rating. I am interested to see what yours is. Oh, gosh. So we already know my feelings that I think it was a filler, which I'm very disappointed in. But upon rewatching with the subtitles and getting a little bit more information, also, I there there were more things I enjoyed the second time watching. I'm going to give it a seven. Oh, okay. I'm kind of yeah. surprised. I, I was going to get a, a five like you, mm -hmm. but I think a seven. I mean, they didn't do a bad job. There were things that I really liked. I don't know if you want to get into yet, but... Are they part of your three key, um, not really. key moments? Not okay, really. Go ahead. I enjoyed... I don't know if you've ever seen The Frighteners. What's that for it's those a, listening? It's a movie with Michael J. Fox. Okay. Uh, came out in like 1996. It sounds like a horror movie. It is, right? Okay. So um, when they went into the spirit world where Aang accidentally brings them all mm -hmm. and like they like pop out of their bodies as ghosts. Mm -hmm. So that's like like a felt like a really cool homage to the Frighteners, even though they, okay. like they use the same. I don't even know. <laughs> 
the cinematography. Visuals, yeah, the like, visuals was reminiscent of. Yeah, that's what okay. I thought. I was like, oh, that's really cool. I haven't seen that since I watched The Frightener. So I was like, oh, that's really cool. That's so interesting you say that because we'll have some words when we get to our our key moments with our honorable mention, our rough buddy moment and all that. I do want to say, I haven't shown you this, but I looked back at how you've, well, how we've both rated each of the past episodes. And you have a pattern that you have now broken because you started out rating the episodes as a five. And then you rated the second episode as an eight. And then the third episode was a five. And then the last episode was an 8.5. So you've had this up-down pattern. So I was fully expecting like a four or a five from you. I would say I'm pleasantly surprised. I got to keep you and our listeners on their toes. And I feel like with the exception of the last episode, we've been pretty opposite. All the episodes that you rated lower, I still rated pretty high. So... Yeah, I'm shocked, but I shouldn't be shocked. <laughs> I think they've the just pattern. broken me down, and now I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> You're worn down. <laughs> well, then, with the cabbage ratings out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about our personal key moments. So we have our Avatar State moment, which is our favorite or best moment, our That's Rough Buddy moment, our worst moment, and then an honorable mention for each of us. I want you to go ahead and go first for your Avatar State moment. So this was your favorite thing about this episode. Um, so it was Gyatso choosing to stay to help Aang instead of moving on to the next stage of enlightenment. What a powerful... I mean, that, that, that scene with him and Aang, it really tugged at my heart. Did you cry? I did not cry. You wanted to, though. I wanted to cry. But uh, it was, it touched me. I thought it was, they did it really well. And uh, Gyatso also telling Aang to let it go. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't going to be able to save them. Sorry. And it's not his fault. And then that kind of like that sigh of relief almost from Aang. Was it a sigh of relief? I took it as like a sigh of relief. Like, (sighs) you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of Riley on Inside Out. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, where she was just holding on to all those feelings and then she finally just let it out and cried and We're then some crazy had references. like a shudder. Yeah. Yours more yeah. recent, but yeah. Well, yeah, because I have a terrible memory and I haven't watched nearly as many movies and shows as you have. So I'm going to have to rely on you here to make the references to other <laughs> media. But yeah, my reference for today it was a Disney Pixar movie. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, what 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 was your Avatar State moment? Um, pretty much the same. That whole scene with Aang and Gyatso and their tearful reunion also tugged at my heartstrings. I wanted to cry really bad too, similar to the the leaves from the vine moment with Iroh and Zuko. I did not cry. I held it. <laughs> I kept it together. But pictures or it didn't happen. It was mostly due to Aang's reaction and just how Gordon Cormier acted out that scene. Uh, his his facial expressions really conveyed the grief that he was holding on to. And it, it's implied in all of the episodes, the things that he's having to carry. I like to say he's a great actor. Yes. Gyatso. Like his laugh. I just. Yes. He's amazing. How he, you know, tricked Aang, you know, oh, you cheated. Yeah. Yes, brought back that playfulness, showing their, I don't know if it was their last Pi Show game together, but their, where they had left off from that game. And yeah, just both of their reactions. And like you said, Gyatso telling him that he doesn't have to hold on to that guilt. It's not his fault. And what he didn't say, what was implied was that if he had stayed, the Avatar would have been dead. So it was a good thing that Destiny led him away from his home that fateful night so we'll get more into that but that was also my avatar state moment what about your that's rough buddy moment okay so so what was our theme for this episode did you pick out a theme i did but i was gonna wait to get into it so what if okay i want to see what okay so my rough buddy moment it's when katara and her mom were hiding in the ice shed the, the igloo? <laughs> the igloo. I sh- wow. I even wrote okay. down I should. Uh, but it, yeah, their igloo. So she knew it was going to happen, but obviously she goes in there. And she's the reason her mom got killed. Like mm-hmm. bending that water and the guy seeing it. So I thought that was pretty rough. Like, holy crap, she's she got her mom killed. Did you like that moment? No, I didn't like it. 
That was sad. You think? Do you think that them adding that detail? I was going to talk about it later, but since you brought it up, did you feel that them adding that detail made the episode better, or because are, are you saying that's that rough, buddy? Because of how it made you feel, like that is a rough moment, or did you just not like it altogether? No, the scene obviously gave me emotion, so okay. they did a good job there. But it's just, I was like, dang, yes, that's rough, buddy. Yes, very true. Okay, so what was your that's rough buddy moment? My rough buddy moment, it wasn't chosen because it was a rough emotion or anything like that. I just chose this because I didn't like how they did it or it could have been done better in my opinion. I get what you're saying. I'll stop you. Can I stop you real quick? Yes. So usually our that's rough buddy moment is the worst moment. Like not how you feel, but... Just you thought they did it terribly. It could be either way. Okay. I don't. I, so don't I didn't want to ruin that. I don't want to necessarily put this in just one box because it can mean different things for different people. I don't want to confuse people that are listening. Right. Right. So, so I, as long I think as long as we're clarifying it okay. that. Um, Sorry because, for interrupting I, you. No, that's fine. So you mentioned what was that movie you said? The, the Frighteners. Fr- the Frighteners. Okay, so you mentioned that scene where they're being pulled into the spirit world. That was my that's rough buddy moment. What? Why? Because it felt a little cheesy to me. What part was cheesy? Just the way that it looked where they were glowing blue. It did feel, it felt a little old school. And because the thing is, after that moment, the way they fully got pulled into the spirit world looked cool. I think when that moment happened where they were glowing blue, I was worried that they were going to look like that the entire time they were no, going to be in the No, but that was an world. homage to the cartoon, right? Doesn't Aang look bluish when he is chasing after Heibai and then comes back and tells Katara, you know, uh, I couldn't I couldn't get Sokka. But isn't See, he like a- see-through bluish? I guess initially, maybe. That's the thing about the spirit world in the cartoon is that the rules and boundaries of the spirit world are left ambiguous on purpose. And the rules shift as the episodes go along and as they build onto the lore of the spirit world. So every time we encounter the spirit world in Avatar The Last Airbender, there's some slight differences each time. It just felt a little cheesy to me at first that they were glowing blue and I thought it could have been done differently. How would you have done it? I think if they just went straight into how they did the visuals Make when they blurry. were fully in, you know, when Aang first connected with Avatar Kyoshi. Yeah, they made it blurry and... Yeah, it had that kind of weird look. I don't know how to describe that, but they did the same thing again when they got fully pulled in. And it was echoed first whenever they came upon that Earth Kingdom village and Aang could feel yeah, that the... felt the felt the spirit worm. Yes, and that the veil was thin there. Yeah. That kind of like... <laughs> I am making movements, yeah. which is not good for a podcast, but yeah, I hope you're picking up what I'm putting down. That's just my opinion. So that's my that's rough buddy moment. What about your honorable mention? Something else that you liked? Um, just something else. I really enjoyed, for some reason, uh, Co. The face dealer. I thought they did an awesome job. That bam, that bamboo, that or baboon, bamboo, <laughs> the baboon. <laughs> That, you know, came out and was laughing. I was like, oh, scary as hell, but that was it awesome. It is scary. I did like Ko. So, yeah, that's a good honorable mention. What, how about you? Mine was just the whole tavern scene with Zuko and Iroh. It was pretty funny. Yeah, and they were and they were kind of talking, you know, uh, that the Avatar's been out doing all that. You know, that you... Yeah, well... Oh, we're we'll, going to get we'll into get that? into it, because right. there's a lot of good things to pull from that one small scene. So those are our personal key moments. Do you want to go ahead and really dive into this episode now? Let's do it. Okay. So we have a lot of things to talk about. Before we get into into the theme, because for once I haven't told you ahead of time what theme I pulled from this episode, Just let's just go ahead and get the opening and really the whole beginning out of the way. And then we'll get into theme and talk about some of the characters as well. So first of all, this one almost made my honorable mention, but... I really liked the way they did the cold open in this episode, jumping straight into them, running through the forest, trying to escape the Fire Nation soldiers. Um, How many of them are there? (laughs) I don't know, five, maybe more. (laughs) So it was just, it was different. And I think at this point, since we're over halfway through, they need to start throwing in 
different things to hold our attention. So I thought that was good. Sokka had some great moments at the beginning, too. I put down here, apparently Sokka is the Riz bender, <laughs> as the kids Oh my gosh, say. what does that mean? Riz, like charisma. That sounds really... Do you know uh, where Riz comes you know from? What a, do you know what a Riz bender is? <laughs> <laughs> Cover your Riz, ears, kids. Riz comes from charisma. No, well, let's not do this. We have an 11-year-old, <laughs> so we hear all the, the lingo of know. the youth these days. <laughs> I am not going to pretend like I'm hip. But do you know what I'm talking about, though? No. That apparently... Oh, yeah, he's a player. He's he uh, he's great with the ladies. And um, <laughs> I think it was... A, a, was it like a, maybe a Fire Nation girl or something that he... Yeah, how do you know? How are you supposed know. to know she was a spy? Is that what they said? I think so, yeah. Oh, okay. So I thought that was funny. It adds to his ladies' man type of persona. There were a couple callbacks to the cartoon, too, with Sokka. When he saw that little girl and he said, my name is Sokka. It rhymes with Akka. Yeah. And waka waka. And in the same breath, he pulls out a Pippin Padalopsicopolis the third. Right. That was brilliant. I want to hear you say it because I already said it in one of our previous episodes. You say it. Pippa paddle pop galak yeah. <laughs> Don't judge me. And even harder is try spelling it. Yeah. I'm, I'm Which, by that. the way, Netflix subtitles totally got that wrong. There is a right way to spell Pippin Paddle Opsicopolis. Oh. They split it up in two names. Jeez. So Netflix, I have a bone to pick with you. That's what you put some respect on Bonzu Pippin Paddle Opsicopolis <laughs> the third. <laughs> Move on. Move on, Paul. Okay. Let's see. What else with the beginning? Here's a negative that lent to my cabbage rating. The beginning was very exposition heavy. I know that there's a lot to explain when it comes to the spirit world, but Aang was just info dumping. And I think part of it, too, is the fact that it was Aang that was having to, to explain all of this. Because if you're a first time watcher, you're probably wondering, where did you. Yeah, he keeps get saying, I don't knowledge. know what I'm doing, but. Here's the information. Yes. So which one is it? Do you know what you're doing or do you not know what you're doing? But to me, that's on the writing. The whole episode, though, like you said, it does have a horror-esque vibe, which the other episodes did not. I think back in the day when shows had or cartoons had like their Halloween episode or Halloween special, <laughs> if this was back in the day, this would have been the Halloween special. So Agreed. Sokka's interaction with the little girl was super sweet. I know you have the Pippa Papa Bakalaga Bakabits thing, but just his whole interaction with her was really sweet. I'm really liking Sokka. Me too. I think I've liked Sokka from the beginning, and his portrayal of his character has been pretty consistent and consistently done well. So yeah, that was a good, sweet interaction. What was not a sweet interaction, but I still liked it just as much, was Zuko and Lieutenant G. Oh, yeah, I actually wrote that down. Cover your ears. I wrote Zuko... Is a dick. <laughs> Babe. <laughs> to his soldiers. I mean, come on. Yeah, he's not very nice to Lieutenant G, and we've seen that in past episodes as well. And I feel bad for G, because he's just doing his oh, job. No. And G's definitely betraying him, by the way. Well, yeah, I think it's been hinted at, but... I mean, that's Zuko's doing, though. Okay, so first of all, in this interaction, we get a really sassy Zuko. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there even does it with his face and yeah. his movements. He's very sassy. Yeah. I'm going to channel some of that sass sometimes. They can't see you, babe. Huh? They can't see you. I know. Brother. I'm doing the head thing. Because what was it that he and... said? He was like, so you mean to tell me? <laughs> 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 oh, my gosh. That was just, that was amazing. Um, side note about Zuko's scar. Because I feel like a, a lot of fans have been harping on his scar and its appearance and that it's not prominent enough it's a scar but like so when i was watching him talk to g i it i don't know why it came up here but it made me realize that his scar reminds me a lot of the scar that i had on my leg that i got because i got badly burned there side story when i was a kid it was a really hot Missouri day. There was a, some sort of equipment sitting outside. It had been sitting out in the sun all day, and it had, like, this metal piece to the side of it. It was so hot that I'm sure you could have, like, cooked eggs on it or something. It was very hot. And I was playing near it, and my leg touched the, the metal part, and it was so hot that I didn't even realize that I was being burned. Um, it actually 
felt cool at first because it was so hot. It was a really weird sensation. And then eventually I started feeling like really bad pain. So it burned layers of my skin. Like it was, this is probably a graphic way of describing it, but it was like white bubbly skin. And when it did heal, it looked like Zuko scar. That's exactly what my scar looked like, albeit a smaller scar, but that's how it looked for years and years and even to adulthood. Um, it's mostly faded now. I'm surprised that it's uh, started to go away, but I'm just I'm just saying his scar to me, it hot take is was, pretty realistic. So that was a uh, I know yeah, like I really side- edit that down. <laughs> <laughs> But it makes it more interesting instead okay. of just plowing through the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, his scar looks fine. It looks like so, he got burnt in the face. Leave his scar alone. Leave Zuko alone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just had to get that out of, out of the way, get it off my chest. I stand his scar. But yeah, so Zuko and Lieutenant G's whole interaction, I would say is it's planting the seeds with Lieutenant G. He's basically a spy now. I mean, but I, wouldn't you say it's a direct result from how Zuko was treating him? Yeah, he's so, treating him like a housemaid. So I like how Netflix has planted the seeds with where things may be going with Lieutenant G. So, so this whole thing is unique to this series or to the Netflix version. Speaking of planting the seeds, let's go ahead and get into our theme. So first I want to bring up that there is one scene where Azula said to Ozai that they should water the most promising seeds, right? Right. And in one of the beginning scenes, Katara says to Aang, seeds are for the future, not past mistakes. And that's when she hands him the seed um, when they discover that the forest has well, been burned I wish burned we would have talked about this earlier. You just took both my quotes, but <laughs> you're good. Uh, so... <laughs> The theme that I pulled from this, and again, this is, I'm not saying like this is definitively the theme of the whole episode. I'm sure people would have different opinions, but this is just what I got out of it. So the question here is, what seeds are being watered? And I feel like this plays throughout the whole episode, and I do want to talk about it. I like that. Can I tell you what I think the theme should be? Yeah, go right ahead. Truth. Finding the truth. Because that's what they're doing in the spirit world is finding the truth of the, about themselves and they're not going to like it. Although, I believe Aang finding out his truth with Gyatso telling him, you weren't going to be any help. You were going to die. That's his truth, right? Mm-hmm. But Katara and Sokka's truth were more painful. I thought about that, too, because they did mention truth. I would almost say that you could almost swap seed with truth. Okay. You see what I'm saying? So what truths are are you watering? It it will make more sense as we talk about it, but do you see where I'm going with it? I see where you go. What what, what truths are being watered? Yes. (laughs) Why are you laughing? Are you answering that or... We will get oh, we're to, gonna answer we'll that. Get to it. We're doing a um, podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. First, I want to talk about the spirit world. Since a lot of this takes place in the spirit world, let's go ahead and, and talk about the spirits and some of the things that they encounter in the spirit world. So first spirit is Wan Chi Tong, and he is the spirit of knowledge. A lot of Avatar fans already know this. Wan Chi Tong, the translation for that is he who knows 10,000 things. Fun fact, though, he is voiced by Randall Duke Kim, and he was in the last Airbender movie. What? That shall not be named. The movie that shall not be named. He played, I think, an old guy or like an old man in one of the temples. What a great movie. That's cool that he was in that, and then he gets to be in the series as well. And then I think he's most known for being the turtle in Kung Fu Panda, but you're more, you and Zoe are more familiar with Kung Fu Panda than I am, but he voices the turtle so next time you guys watch kung fu panda you'll hear Mm. wan Wan chi tong (laughs) awesome what did you think of uh uh uppity and uh i wonder if he tastes like chicken oh my gosh okay (laughs) Uh, you are Sokka. oh my goodness (laughs) i mean it was good washing tongue i'm not sure how i feel about them putting wan chi tong 
in this season. And I'm probably going to reiterate this a few times while we discuss it because a lot of things are being pulled from different episodes or different seasons. So we meet Wan Chi Tong much earlier than we do in in the cartoon, Season which two. typically I would not have a problem with, but then it makes me wonder how does this affect the events of season two? Because uh, Wan Chi Tong first appeared in the cartoon in a very important episode. Just interested to see how they go about that. But aside from that, I get why he was here. He's a spirit. This is spirited away. I wonder if they're going to stick with only the Avatar knows what the animals are saying. The spirits. The spirits, yes. Yeah. Is that, I mean, they got to stick with it now, right? <laughs> I don't, they don't so have that, to. So, yes, you're right. You did bring up a good point. In the original, Aang is not the only one that can understand the spirits. Katara and Sokka can understand Wan Chi Tong just fine. Let's move to my <laughs> next, the next one, which was one of my favorites, which is Hei Bai. Hei Bai was one of your favorites. So Hei Bai is the spirit of the forest. Again, it's no secret that the translation of his name is black and white. The thing is, the people who have only watched this, they don't realize that he is a panda spirit. <laughs> Unless you got that from the statues, because they did show the Hei Bai statue. Mm -hmm. And it's a statue of a panda, but I wasn't sure if that was clear to everybody. But... Yep, hey bye, black and white. So he reminded me of Venom from from Marvel. Venom. Oh, uh, okay. See, I'm not the Marvel nerd, but I'm sure many people listening <laughs> yeah, are. So I, I bet they would agree. It was awesome. Oh, by the way, I had a question on Hey Bye. Yes, he did the towards the end of his sequence. He did the open his mouth, the light shines, right? Mm -hmm. But was he releasing the fog of confusion or the fog of lost soul whatever that is? Fo fog of lost souls. Was he spewing that out of his That's my question to you cuz I wasn't sure and I don't know. It looks like it, but I don't know for sure if Kbai is the cause of the fog of lost souls. Help us out here people. Um the only reason why I would think no is because I mean, unless he did that every single time somebody came into the spirit world, because, I mean, the villagers were lost in there, too. That's a good question, but I don't know. Anyways, loved Hei Bai. Looked, looked scary, but, I mean, their original did, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it looked almost identical with the origi original. Oh, yeah, and, um, and I loved how they showed the scar and that the scar was also on the statue so i thought that was a nice touch too what about ko the face stealer ko was my favorite ko was my honorable mention oh yeah that's right yeah. um very scary so ko, very scary ko so the name ko just a fun fact here is similar to the japanese word cow which means face Mur. so not you said cow well, I think that's the close enough pronunciation, Cal. So, Ko feeds on people who are, and this was a direct quote, paralyzed by despair and doubt. So, that's a slight difference from the cartoon where he fed on people, or he sold the faces of anybody that showed any kind of emotion. So, what did you think about that change? Um, They rushed into it, but... I don't know, because what, what in the cartoon, he got all the information about Ko from Avatar Roku, so there was no information when he went in in the live action. That's the only thing. I mean, you weren't supposed to look at him or make any... Emotions. Emotions. Yes. I mean, I think if they would have done a bunch of explaining about Ko beforehand, then I would have really felt like it was heavy on the exposition, so I can see why they didn't have that. I still think they they did co-justice, even with the slight differences. They say people paralyzed by despair and doubt. I mean, that's still yeah. a type of emotion. No, I like the character. Awesome. Mm -hmm. He's so scary. Super scary. And what did Aang steal from him? I want to know. We will find out. Fun fact with Ko, he is voiced by George Takei. So, oh, really? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, George Takei has done many, many things. Um, he was in the original Avatar. He right? was. As most people know, he's known for Star Trek. But in the original Avatar, he voiced the warden. I didn't pick up on it when first watching the episode, so I'm a little ashamed that I didn't realize it was George Takei. But now, 
I can't unhear his <laughs> voice. So I think they made a good choice with bringing in George Takei f- uh, to voice him. And honestly, bringing in these different OG Avatar voice actors to voice different things. Okay, so a few other encounters um, in the spirit world. There was the white fox that talked to Sokka. Which is something completely new, so we're not sure where they're going with this white fox. All I can say is that it reminded me of the foxy knowledge seekers from the Wanshi Tong episode yeah. um, in the cartoon. What did you think of this fox or the purpose of this fox? So it's telepathically communicating with Sokka. Is it? Because, I mean, its mouth it, was moving, wasn't was it? Was it? Can I pull it up <laughs> real quick? See? Okay. Mouth's moving, blew whatever I was going to say out of the water. <laughs> I loved it. No, uh, it was okay. Like, What did you think? I know that there is a purpose for this fox. I mean, there has to be. Otherwise, it would just be super random. The voice has a very distinct voice. Without saying any spoilers, I want to say that this is this is probably in relation to a future character. Oh, really? Um. I want you to tell me. After, after, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> I will let you I know. Don't get to know. I will let you know. What I didn't catch is what's on its tail. Agreed. I, I know that they made the sound and they z- kind of zoomed in, not really zoomed mm-hmm. in, but. What was even the sound? So it's like metal. I Maybe was... she was showing her bling off. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it had on its tail, again, probably tied to who I think this is referencing. You, so, so you think that's like a, like a cuff? It has to be a something bracelet? like that. It's not very it's not very big. So, so did that fox get into something and that's like you know how a fish gets caught in trash? Did that fox get, <laughs> get some <laughs> trash caught on its know. tail? That's just a little bit of mystery right there. The fox also reminded me of some it looked like a Pokemon to me, so <laughs> and then I also want to bring up the fog of lost souls. So in the cartoon, the fog of lost souls, first of all, it wasn't even an, an Avatar The Last Airbender. This is something directly from The Legend of Korra. Korra yeah. So I thought it was cool that they brought it into Avatar. And in Korra, the Fog of Lost Souls is a spirit of its own. But in the same way, it it disorients people and it messes with them. The only other thing I had about the Fog of Lost Souls was wondering whether or not Heibai was the one that caused it. Dev, we're going to say that the Fog of Lost Souls came from Heibai. His mouth. I'm going to agree. We'll just go with it. Okay, so that's all the spirit world talk. Now I want to talk about, you already brought up the truth. So oh, this no. is going back to our theme of what seeds are being watered. Let's go ahead and, you know, get lost in the fog and, and go through the <laughs> different memories and flashbacks. so cheesy. <laughs> I am still trying to learn how to properly segue from one thing to another. We're not professionals here, people. That was pretty good, by the way. (laughs) So let's just, we're just going to go in order. So we will start with Katara. So what seeds has Katara been watering? And in my opinion, I think the seeds that she has been watering is guilt and grief. Because that's what her whole flashback is about. It's it's the one moment that she has the most guilt about. Um, and you already brought up the fact that Katara tried to water bend, and that was the whole reason that the Fire Nation soldier knew that there, were, there was for sure a water bender in that igloo, and Katara's mom Kaya had to sacrifice herself to protect her daughter. So, um, can I just give the Actress for the young version of Katara, I just want to give her major props because she killed it. The way that she acted that scene, it was just phenomenal. She did a good job. She has That girl has acting chops. <laughs> what did you think about them showing the soldier roasting Katara's mom? Well, she looks like he was. she was getting ready to airbend or waterbend him and she could have killed him. So he was basically defending himself. Yes. That's what but I as we know, she is not the waterbender. Yeah. So she She's was just pre- putting on an act. Yeah. That was really sad. And then wh- what so I what was. What truth did she need to learn there? Or what? It's not. Or was it just the truth that she got her mom killed? It's them facing things that they haven't necessarily talked about outright. And it's just something that they're holding inside. This is their truth that they're carrying. So for Katara, 
the seed that she's been watering is that I am responsible for my mother's death. Yes, so. Which she is correct. And that's why it showed in the Jet episode that it was causing, it was like a block to her water bending because that's what she kept seeing as the truth. Yeah. So what do you think, just speculate on what you think is going to get Katara out of the fog of lost souls? Um, Aang. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. An act, an, an, I already made a Frozen reference earlier, but an act of true love. <laughs> oh, gosh. And then we have uh, Sokka and his memories that he's having to face. So the seed that Sokka has been watering this whole time is doubt and shame. If you were to go back and watch previous episodes and really pay attention to Sokka's interactions with other people, you can tell that there is this doubt and shame that he carries but we find out that it's because of his father so this was something unexpected since it wasn't in the cartoon but his father hakoda expressed his disappointment in him yeah his father's a butthole <laughs> seriously bato makes a better father than hakoda you think so oh yeah dude he's just a little kid you wanted him to Control a ship in ice seas. I mean, he was harsh, but I think we, what we have to remember is that no character is black or white. Everybody has a little gray area in them, too. But yeah, he was a little harsh. I don't like what they're doing with Sokka's father. It was unfortunate that Sokka did hear that. And there was an important thing that Hakoda said. I didn't write it down, but he said something along the lines of, some people are just not meant to have others' lives in their hands. And I think that's going to play a key thing in Sokka, the choices and feelings that Sokka has in the future. Okay. I don't like what they're doing with their father. Um, Sokka in the cartoon is very proud of his father and looks up to him. And He is still, though. He's, uh, I, But I think that's why he feels even there's more reason to feel shame is because he wants to be like his father. He wants to make him proud, similar to some other characters in the show. They're giving him daddy issues. I don't like it. <laughs> but I like it, though, okay. because it adds layers. It adds some tension, adds some conflict, and that there's some reconciliation that needs to happen here. And that's my that's what I think. Let's move on. All right. So now let's go to Aang and his memories and his encounter with Gyatso. So first... Let me just go ahead and get the nerding out of the way here. The color grading for when Aang was in the fog, well, really when all of them were in the fog, going from the fog to the memories, it went from a very desaturated tone, then transitioning to full color whenever they were being faced with their memories. And this was really apparent whenever Aang went from the fog and then stumbled out of the fog and it transitioned to full color. Very Wizard of Oz. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Did you know. catch that? You'll have, <laughs> you need to rewatch it and see it because that was pretty cool. So anyways, let's talk about the quote unquote seeds that Aang has been watering. So I think it's the same as Katara. He's been dealing with guilt and grief. And I would say even a little bit of doubt because in earlier in the episode, he talks about how he doesn't know what he's doing as the Avatar. But he's almost pulled into his memory of the Southern Air Temple. But he's able to take a step back and realize this is not real. And he's able to see through it and move on. So unlike Sokka and Katara, he's able to resist what the fog of souls or the fog of lost souls is doing to him and then that's where you know ko comes into the picture and i think ko even says oh you're able to that's how he realizes you're the avatar yeah maybe do you think that maybe the avatar has some kind of immunity to it or, or maybe just because the avatar is the avatar is to... most powerful in the spirit world at least that's what they told us in Korra. we know Aang's a very powerful avatar yeah, I think him being able to resist is because he's powerful. Um, and then we have him chased by Ko, uh, and then he stumbles upon Gyatso. And the most important thing here is that Gyatso absolves Aang of any feelings of responsibility to what happened. 
And I know we already talked about this because this was our Avatar State moment, but I thought that was like, I really was waiting for some kind of moment where someone tells Aang, hey, buddy, it's not your fault. I'm glad that they had Gyatso be the one to do that because I think that's even more meaningful. And Gyatso helps him realize what's important and that's the people that he cares about here and now. Yeah, I think we're going to see a a humongous growth from Aang because now he doesn't have to bear the weight of feeling like it was his fault. Right, I agree. I think Gyatso's role here is helping him plant the seeds of healing for Aang. So that way his guilt and grief and doubt can be replaced with something else that will help him grow to be the Avatar. And I feel like that they, whether this is intentional or not, um, they used Aang physically planting the seed as a metaphor for this. That he's start. I don't know if I want to say starting a new beginning here, but because he's able to start healing things to Gyatso, he's finally able to what was it that I said Katara said? Plant the seeds for Seeds the for the future, not past mistakes. Correct. So I think that's really what all this episode was about, was we have characters who are watering the seeds that they shouldn't be, which is their past mistakes, their burdens, when they should be planting or watering the seeds of... The future. Yeah, the, the seeds that are going, going to help them grow and become better people. So yeah, I think for Aang... What replaces all this hurt for him is love and confidence because now he has this resolution of, okay, I am going to go see Roku to get help to save the people that I care about. So he's made a decision here. He has a direction and he's feeling a little bit more confident or at least he seems that way. Do you have anything else you want to talk about? You wrapped it up pretty, pretty good. Okay, so that was with our core group there. What's interesting is that I feel like this theme also carries over to our Prince and Princess of the Fire Nation. Um, Really? So with Zuko, even though uh, Zuko and Azula, they weren't in the Fog of Lost Souls, obviously, but I feel like that they're having to face some truths of their own. And they have also been watering seeds of things that are going to be holding them back i think it's the uh fire lord ozai is watering their their seeds yes i'm glad you say that before we get there though with zuko i feel like the seeds that zuko has been watering is despair and frustration and i don't know why i know i keep saying this but i love that they are making that despair more obvious with this version of zuko i think a lot of people say like oh he seems more like a brat in this version but i feel like it all stems from desperation like he's losing control here his chances of returning home are slipping away so wouldn't that drive you to to act in ways that aren't that great right well i think this episode really taught us like well he wants to play by the rules but you can't play by the rules you got to get dirty and that's Taking a big hit to his character. Are you talking about because of June, the bounty hunter? Yeah, and everything that Ira says, Zhao's basically going to play dirty too. You can't play by the rules here. And he, he's all about honor and keeping that honor. Honor. Yeah, since we have brought up June, let's go ahead and talk about her. First of all, love June. Loved her in the original. Spice. Love her here too. She's a queen. Hitting on Iro. Yeah, so that was a change that I think needed to happen because in the original, Iroh is the one that hits on June. A little creepy, yeah. And it's very creepy. creepy. It did not age well the way the cartoon played that out. What? It was nice to see that they had reversed that and June was the one that was kind of hitting on Iroh and that they did switch that around. I don't really have anything else to say about June. I'm sure next episode we'll see a little bit more. Well, holler, holler out for the holler thing out. she was writing shout the, out to shout the, out holler out that's the same thing as holler I'm out hip, okay <laughs> um yeah shout out to the sheer shoe which we'll talk about in our animal watch but i mean yeah they adapted june pretty well in my opinion yeah that sounds like a cool reality tv show june what? the bounty hunter. june the bounty hunter <laughs> <laughs> and then i just want to go ahead and talk about since we're 
here in the Earth Kingdom village with Zuko and Iroh. We already mentioned the tavern earlier and the funny moments between Zuko and the tavern keeper. Yeah, like sliding him the coins. He's like, how about that? Maybe this will change your... (laughs) And then then the tavern keeper grabs it, pockets it, and then Zuko's like, so have you seen Waterbenders? He's like, no. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it was pretty funny. I did love that. But this is where we find out that, and Zuko finds out that word of the Avatar has gotten out. So that means his chances of uh, getting to Aang first are getting slimmer and slimmer. And what I really loved about the scene and part of why it was my honorable mention was that it had quite a few callbacks to the cartoon. And this is where the subtitles... Yeah, you wouldn't have known if you didn't have the subtitles. Yes, the on. subtitles came in handy here. If you guys didn't catch this, you need to go back and watch it with the subtitles. But the other people in the tavern, they made direct references to the pirates from the waterbending scroll episode in the cartoon, the canyon guide from the infamous The Great Divide, and then even to Aang fighting the volcano from the fortune teller episode. So those are all... It's it's funny that you mentioned that this episode is a filler episode because what they shouted out here were all the... what some people believe to be filler episodes from quests. the cartoon. Yeah, so I thought that was quite of bringing those in without having to actually include them in the episode because I knew that these were things from the original that was going to get cut from the Netflix series. But <laughs> without the subtitles, you wouldn't have really heard it. Because yeah, and it, it was, was hilarious the how they did it because they're like, he's like, so have you seen some waterbenders? No, but I heard the Avatar was with some waterbenders. <laughs> they're like, have you, you know what I'm talking about? And then, then, then that's when they say all that stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. you mean when the pirates? Yeah, the pirates said they... I thought that was funny because now he's yeah. like, oh, crap. <laughs> Everyone knows. It was well done. And then just last thing I want to say about Zuko here, well, really about Iroh, is that I feel like Iroh is helping plant the seeds for Zuko just for his growth. In what way? So similar to how I said that Gyatso was helping Aang plant seeds of healing and, and love I feel like Iroh was serving a similar role for Zuko. So we know that Zu- that sorry, we know that Iroh had to convince Zuko to hire June, and he does that because he sees that Zuko is spiraling down this despair. He just automatically goes to this this place of, oh, all hope is lost. I'm never gonna find the Avatar. As we know, Zuko's a little bit dramatic, but Iroh is always there to help steer him away from that despair to the best of his ability. And and I think we'll continue to see how Iroh will do these things here and there to help Zuko heal a little bit. And there's still so much about Zuko that we need to learn. But I like how, again, I like a broken record here, they're planting the seeds with their relationships. So does that make sense? You're going to hate <laughs> me. But no, I, I didn't see... I mean, other than the Paisho references that he was making, which I thought were was cool and i could see how that could help zuko if zuko was like getting what he was putting down with the pie show references and also when he told him you know she's gonna find the avatar if she doesn't eat who's she june oh so he was like because he's like you know she's a crappy bounty hunter and he's like she's gonna find the avatar if she doesn't get paid she doesn't eat so i thought that was like a i don't know how they how to tie that in there, but I felt like he said that for a reason to help Zuko. To reassure him. Yeah. That this is a good idea. Yeah. I think what I'm trying to say is, so if Zuko keeps watering his despair and um, his frustration, who's going to be the one to help him steer away from that? I think we know the answer to that. Yeah, it's okay. Iroh. So it's June. <laughs> it's not June. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so moving on from Zuko, let's go over to Azula. Um, uh, what was that sigh for? I don't. I know you're not supposed to like Azula, right? But they're like really. I mean, I love Azula. Beating up on that dude when he's like, "Hey, oh, stop!" Yeah, that I was mean, awesome. no means no, Azula. So to tie into our theme here, what Azula has been watering is jealousy and doubt because she wants to be good enough for her father and you already mentioned it that ozai is the one doing well, the watering doing the watering but not in a good way unlike iroh because i told you iroh steers zuko away from his despair and whatnot 
Ozai is steering Azula towards this jealousy and this doubt. And the way that he smirked makes me feel like he's doing this on purpose. Oh, he's absolutely he, doing it He on knows purpose. what he's doing. Yeah. So, I would he knows say... He's gonna, he, like you said, uh, water the most promising seeds. Yes. He's watering her. Oh, gosh. That sounds been, so horrible. That, no, don't, don't. <laughs> the thing is, I wouldn't... It, it's kind of funny that Azula was the one that said, water the most promising seed. And even though they are Fire Nation... Ozai is not using water here. He's all fire. <laughs> I thought the water was just a metaphor. It is, but oh, okay. I was just I just thought it was ironic. Yeah, he's he's I rain water on a zoo. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> all right, let's move okay. on. Okay, but you know what I'm saying though, and and we get and, yeah we get what you're throwing down. So something's going on there with Ozai. I love that they added this. Um, layer to Azula and her relationship with her, her father because this is new. I thought it was a really good way of showing what makes Azula tick because otherwise it's like we, we have an already crazy Azula and no explanation as to why she's like that. Because um, her dad's insane. Yeah, and there's way more to Azula than just this, but I thought that it especially like for first time viewers, it would make them understand Azula's character a little bit more. And then you brought up her training session where she was just beating on that guy. And it just shows how Azula is relentless because I don't know if that's been psycho. in psycho, but I feel like up to this, um, up until this point, they haven't fully conveyed how brutal Azula can be because I mean, she does have a sweeter face and, Looks like she just wants to impress her father. But no, she has a brutal side. And I don't know if you caught this, but when she was about to roast that guy, you saw just a glimpse of blue fire. Oh, I caught it. Right right as, uh, what was it? Was it Ty Lee? Or who grabbed her arm? Maybe both of them. I can't remember. But it May, was one May of, grabbed her arm. It was May or Ty Lee. So I thought that was cool because I didn't know if we were going to get to see the blue fire. And then that adds another question to azula and just the world building in general like blue fire who can bend blue fire so um i liked seeing that and speaking of may and tai lee i think i like them better in this scene because i see what they're trying to do here with may and tai lee the two of them i mean i guess like in the cartoon the two of them round out azula but i think it's even more apparent at least with may i feel like they added a little bit more depth to May's character because while Tai Lee feeds Azula's ego, May keeps her in check. Yeah, they dampen her psychoticness. Yes, so I I appreciated Tai Lee and May more in this scene. Did you have any No, it was brief, but I wish we got a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to see how May is going to play out because in the cartoon... At least in the beginning, she is really just that trope of apathetic, gothic teenager. And there wasn't really a whole lot to her. I don't know. I didn't... Before I said I didn't like May in this version, but I might change my mind. We'll yeah, see. she's probably going to be one of your favorite characters. You think so? I, I believe so. Huh. We will see. Now that we've said seed so many times... <laughs> many times and watering and, and all that. Um, let's wrap up this conversation of the theme and, and just our deep analysis here. Let's wrap it up with the ending of the episode. So Aang gets a new quest. Aang decides to go to the Fire Nation so he can find Roku's shrine and reach out to him. And I don't know if we already said this, but Yatsu said Roku was the last avatar to confront Ko, because Ko says he stole something from him, but we don't know what that is. I think it's interesting that it's Roku that is in this role, but I think they needed to find a way to, to bring in Roku. Yeah, you have to. They haven't yet. Things are about to heat up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, so one thing that made me sad was when Aang said that he'll be back. And he'll come see Gyatso and they'll have more time to talk when he returns. And Gyatso's reaction tells me otherwise. And I don't know. I have this feeling that he's not going to be there when Aang gets back. I think I was, I'm a little more optimistic about it because, you know, time is a funny thing. And maybe, 
He's not necessarily going to be there when Aang's done, but maybe in a different time in Aang's yeah, life. I hope so. But the way that Gyatso had that look on his face, like he was about to cry, I was like, mm. okay. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that. And since you brought that up, I do want to go ahead and read Gyatso's closing monologue. I have a feeling maybe this will be the clip that I play at the beginning. I haven't decided yet, but I wanted to read it because it is really good. You're going to read the whole thing? Yeah. His monologue at the end, he says, Time is a funny thing. The past, the future, it all gets mixed up. There's only one way to keep it straight. It's by remembering what really matters. Of course, keeping sight of what's important can be hard. Sometimes it feels like we'll always be alone, and the only one keeping us company is our own pain. We tell ourselves that we are the problem, especially when things we can't control come our way. That's why we must let go of our pain and regret and remember what it is we're really fighting for. The ones we love. Let that be the light that guides you through the most treacherous of times and the darkest of nights. So I just thought that was really good. And showing all of our main characters throughout that monologue, kind of reminding what everybody is going through. And it made me realize that everybody in this episode faced being alone with their pain at some point. Our main ones and also Zuko and Azula. And uh, so I thought that was a nice, neat little bow that they added to the end of the episode um and then also just real quick in these ending scenes i noticed that they made ang and azula foils of each other so similar to how iroh and ozai are kind of foils of each other in one of the last scenes you see ang come back from the spirit world and he glances over at katara and Sokka, who are unconscious on the ground he glances at them and he knows that he needs to do what he can to help them and then he leaves for the fire nation one of Azula's last scenes, she's training, and they show Mei and Tai Li sleeping. But the difference with Azula is that she doesn't really show that she cares about them. She is focused on herself, and she continues to train and train. And it shows the differences and where their headspace is at right now. So I just wanted to shout That's that out. That's an interesting observation. I like it. Did you have anything else about analyzing this episode Anything in your notes that we didn't get to? I think we covered everything. All right. So then let's go ahead and get into our favorite bending moments. I'll go ahead and say mine first. I There wasn't a lot of bending in this episode, first of all, because you can't bend in the spirit world. But I did like Katara's ice discs that she did at the beginning. I thought that was a cool move. Yeah, it wasn't original, but yeah, it what was you, cool. What do you mean wasn't original, though? They've already shown it with the... With the Earthbenders. Oh, with Boomy, yeah. So, it was cool. Uh, my favorite bending moment was none. I mean, literally, what? I think it all the bending was done in like the first four minutes of the episode, and then you didn't have any more air bending or bending. Sorry. Yeah. What about Azula and her fire? It's true, but right now she doesn't look like she's very good at bending fire. What? Yeah. Where I mean, have you what, what, been? What do we? What do we see her? I mean. Like a couple streaks of fire, but I mean, it's not, I think, we, we know that she's powerful or... I think we know that she's powerful. We haven't, they've purposely held back on showing what So how she do we do. know she's powerful? Because do you see her flawless techniques? <laughs> her flawless... What? Are you being like serious? Like what Ty Lee says, like she's being, perfect. Well, she's, she's supposed to, she's a royal. You have to praise her <laughs> or Azula could just have her killed. So True. You. I don't have a favorite bending moment. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, then, do you have a favorite character for this episode? It's probably the same as yours, but it's my yours. favorite character was Gyatso. Oh, why is that? Just because I like that they brought him back and did what they did with him. Gyatso sacrificed to to not move on to the s mm -hmm. next stage of enlightenment, which I mean that's, that's what huge. they were living for. Yeah. So their friendship must be really strong. And I'm guessing we'll see him again. That's a good point. I didn't pick up on that, that it is a sacrifice to them because you're right. It's, that's what they strive for. Yeah. That's what they strive for is enlightenment. And he let that go so he, that he could wait for Aang and guide him. Do you think he'll have another chance to move on? That's what I wonder is what's going to, if that's what's going to happen uh, when Aang comes back. Because now it's like, I feel like maybe Gyatso feels... He's now done his part. Oh, so like a ghost that doesn't 
move on like they yeah but then, not like a like ghost, unfinished yeah. business mm-hmm. like why, he, why not like a ghost because he's not a ghost world. he's a ghost but he's not a ghost dude's a ghost <laughs> he died and he's a ghost he's not a ghost so his unfinished business is done his resolve so now he can move on oh that is sad so maybe that's why he's like Oh, that's sad. But I don't. I, but I don't think. I'm thinking that he had the choice of moving. So unlike a ghost who can't, he's a ghost. Crossover. I think you said it was a sacrifice. He knew that he had a role to play in the bigger picture, and he needed to be there for Aang, who was the Avatar. Mm-hmm. So, so who was your favorite character? Mine was Aang, because I felt for him. It it, it really all came down to that scene with the Uh and I think that's why that was our Avatar state moment. But I feel Aang did a lot of growing in this episode, going from being confused and not knowing exactly how to take action to now he's taking action. Yeah, Aang gets this one for me. Awesome. Okay, so then with our animal watch, we already shouted out the sheer shoe. So let's go ahead and talk about the sheer shoe. The sheer shoe is one of the few triple hybrid animals in the avatar verse so it is a combination of a mole an anteater and a wolf wow i did not know that yes i knew the anteater and i didn't know mole and wolf i knew it but it i didn't i it wasn't until adulthood that i realized what, what part what is the issue. wolf what's the wolf part? you have to go back and look at it like it, it's like the fur and the then whiskers. maybe it's tracking abilities but the anteater part obviously with the tongue and then it has the snout of a mole and it is blind it relies on its heightened sense of smell in order to track things down and then its saliva is what causes people to get paralyzed so then it uses its tongue as a whip and paralyzes people yeah so that is the sheer shoe Love also the sheer scary shoe. <laughs> so that was it i think i think for animal watch yeah that was yeah it. i mean netflix you can introduce more animals. Yeah, they it's need okay. To step up their game. It's it's uh, they introduce whatever the um the main animals that have an actual role in the plot. Um but I feel like they are failing to build on the world they by could, showing animals other animals in the background and Momo grabbing that seed though at the beginning that was it was pretty cool. Yes, I'm still a little bit unnerved by Momo's eyes or appearance <laughs> for the, for those who are just listening for the first time i went on about momo and then you were like okay maybe it's not it's he's cute but there's just something about his eyes it's like too cute that it's kind of like was it like the uncanny valley no not even that oh, okay because it doesn't his eyes don't look like a lemur it needs to he needs to look <laughs> Because lemurs are odd looking anyways. They made them too cute. Anyways, I'm getting off of that soapbox. (laughs) And we are going to move on to memorable quotes. So real quick, my memorable quote was his closing monologue that I read. Oh, that's a heck of an out. But that's what I kept coming back to. and, And I think it encompasses this whole episode really well. I agree. I actually picked a like a little piece out of his monologue oh you did which is the only thing keeping us company is our own pain which i feel like is pretty deep if you're depressed i feel like i felt like that sometimes yeah yeah that's a good point it's interesting that even though we had quite opposite cabbage ratings we still had very similar opinions about some of the different parts of this episode so. absolutely i mean we you were only one point off of my cabbage rating oh yeah that's true all righty let's go to our question of the week so we had just asked for our thoughts on the spirits and how the memories and the flashbacks made you guys feel we did get an answer from somebody that oh awesome we... who's who's this from this is from bailey m and they said ko is scary i screamed when he came on my favorite spirit or my favorite part was where sock and katara had to face their own past i did feel bad for katara to see her mom die again and for Sokka to see his dad not believing in him I agree, Bailey. Ko was very scary. I screamed too. I screamed internally. Ko is what mostly put the horror element into this episode. 
And I feel bad for any kid that watched this because, I mean, Ko is the stuff of nightmares. I agree. I wouldn't watch a scary movie with just about Ko. Just, yes. There's so much more to Ko, by the way. That oh, boy, if you get to watch that in VR. What? Oh, if you could have watched that part in VR. Oh, like, no, thank you. But yeah, there's so much more to Ko that even you don't know about. So I hope we see more Ko in the future. So did you, I mean, they say that they feel bad for Katara to see her mom die again. Mm-hmm. Do you, did you feel bad for Katara? Of course I felt bad for Katara because... Knowing that it was her fault? Yeah, because she's ju- she was just a kid. And, I mean, she's technically still a kid. And to harbor that guilt of such a life-changing decision that she made to try to wa- waterbend. And to be honest, I feel like her mom probably would have died even without that. Oh, now you're like, yeah, so her. Don't worry, you were gonna, <laughs> you were gonna die anyway. <laughs> but that's that's part of the seed that she needs to water instead of you know I just, feeling I don't fully get responsible. Hers, but thank you, Bailey, for your comment and your answer. Yes, thank you so much. Oh, and. As always, I just want to remind everybody that our question of the week, we post that on Instagram and Facebook. If you have any thoughts and opinions, feel free to comment under those posts and we'd love to discuss them. Thank you, Bailey, for saving one winged lemur. (laughs) Okay, so before we wrap everything up, do you have any closing thoughts? Yes, I do. Um, This is going to have to get, I hope, Netflix doesn't get like super fast with what's getting ready to happen because they got a lot to put in and there's only three episodes left. And based on my cabbage ratings, this next one's got to be a 10, right? Well, you broke the trend here though. You did. So we'll see what the next one is. I will say knowing the title of the next episode. You know it? Well, yeah, it's there on on, what on is Netflix. It? Like, it's called Masks. <gasps> but that's what I'm saying. We know what's going to happen. I am predicting I'm going to really like this episode. This is the one I've been waiting for. I'm going to wear my mask. <gasps> Will you really? Yeah. Okay. We'll take a picture. We'll post it on our Facebook. Okay. And Instagram. Yeah, those two. And uh, Twitter. No, not Twitter. We are X. Snap, we don't have X. Snap photos. Oh, my gosh. Wes is not a chronically online person. Okay, so let's go ahead and close out this episode. All right, that's our show for today. And as always, we appreciate you all for listening. If you've been enjoying these episodes, we would absolutely love if you leave us a rating to help other Avatar fans find this podcast. We also encourage you to follow and subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our new episodes. And we also love extending the conversation outside of this podcast. So follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Avatar Nation Pod. As much as we love giving our opinions about this show, I mean, we care about yours more. So feel free to share your thoughts with us and we might just feature them on a future podcast episode. With that said, I'm Pauline. And I'm Wes. And you've been listening to Avatar Nation. See you next time. Love ya. Love ya.